Hello, everybody. Um, I didn't want to turn on my cameras because I actually have this surprise for you in that I am standing in Dee's exhibition tonight. We had a life drawing session on, so I was at OMA. So I thought, well, what a better way to show you some of his exhibition than to be here in person. So for those of you that haven't seen it yet, I apologize if I'm spoiling the event for you because I know a couple of you were holding off until after this talk. Um, but you, you still have to come because we are only spotlighting six pieces tonight out of 22. So please make sure that you come. As Monica was saying, um, the exhibition comes down, the final day for it is Saturday, April the 16th. That is also Easter weekend. Uh, so don't, don't plan to come on the 15th because we won't be open for that one. Um, but make sure that you sneak this in, okay? Because it's a very beautiful exhibition. So hopefully I'm not going too quickly for you here today. I, I am going to highlight um, six of these paintings. So I'm just kind of walking through back over to my desk right now, where I will introduce you to Dee, who is patiently waiting right now. Dee, welcome, welcome. Hi, welcome Tanya, to how are you doing? Now. I'm really good, how about you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm so, I have been looking forward to this. I'm so glad that we are doing this tonight. All right, let me just angle this a little bit. Um, so do you mind? So, okay, first off, I'll kind of give the rundown. Hopefully we'll take about an hour here. Mm -hmm. um, I say that we were, I said earlier, we were gonna talk about five, but I actually have a bonus piece to show everybody. So we're gonna do six, we're sneaking in one. Uh, like Monica said, we will do a Q&A at the end. Um, and yeah, this exhibition runs until April the 16th. So make sure, do not miss it. Sounds good? Sounds good. Awesome. So I wanted to introduce you to uh, Dee Asanase Douglas. Um, I think Monica, if you want to show the first slide, we might as well get right into it here. Amazing. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us. Like I said, I've really been looking forward to this. Dee and I have chatted a bit over the past couple months and we always have a great art conversation, don't we? Mm -hmm. um, so this is the first slide. This is Rocket Man, the artist's anguish. Oil on canvas with gold leaf, 16 inches by 16 inches painted in 2021. Um, so I will start by introducing you while this image is up. Dee Asanase Douglas is a Mohawk painter, children's storybook author, and educator. He works primarily with oil on canvas and describes himself as a figurative painter whose work, while exploring indigenous themes, does not follow the rigid characteristics of what is stereotypically considered indigenous art. His practice currently explores indigenous identity, culture, perspectives, and stories through the figure. He is a self-taught artist with formal training in art history and visual design, photography, computer science, social science, and education. That's a long list. It goes on and on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Always learning, right? right. Um, and you would like to thank the Ontario Arts Council for supporting this exhibition. Yep. So I hope you don't mind. I just totally talked about you there. <laughs> That's fine. <Good. laughs> Introduce okay. you. Um, but to start things off, while we have this up, um, the artist anguish, the rocket man, I love it. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to talk to you about your process. So as I mentioned, you have done design work and photography. Uh, so why did you choose oil paint as your medium of choice? Um, well, I've been actually, I've been creating art ever since I was, I think 12 or 13. My first oil, my first acrylic paint painting was when I was around 10. It wasn't very good. I actually, I found it recently. And my first oil paint I, painting was, I was about 13, I think, 14. And, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't really that good back then either, but uh, it, I've always worked with oil. Um, I've tried working with acrylic paint uh, a few times and I just can't get the, uh, the effects that I want. So, you know, oil has just been something that has been part of my life. I was into sculpture and photography and all those other art forms, but I always came back to oil painting and I've always found the human figure, uh, specifically the face, um, intriguing. I think it has a lot to do with my eyesight. I don't have the best of eyesight. And when I speak to somebody, I'm always looking into their eyes and I'm 
you know, it's, it's part of their power. It's part of their personality. So it's something that always strikes me the first time I meet them. Um, you know, process wise, it's changed over the years. And um, even when I paint now, it always sort of flips around depending on what I want to achieve or, or how I'm feeling. Um, I don't particularly like having a detailed sketch and then I'm basically, you know, coloring in the lines. I don't really like that. It's, it's too restrictive. Um, I feel like I have to color in the lines. I'm not the, I'm, I've never been the type of person that colors in the lines very well. Um, one of the methods I'll use is I'll, I'll slap on some paint and I'll, I'll create the form um, of the person that I'm, I'm trying to paint. Just, you know, from, from a, I guess a, a painted sketch, if you want to call it that. Um, occasionally, oh, well, kind of, of of neutral skin tones. Am I right in that? No. Uh, well, what I'll do is I'll start off with a, a ground. So yeah. I'll ha okay, I'll have I'll start from the beginning. I have my canvas, yeah. and typically I, I really like working on Belgium linen right now. It's just it's a really nice material. Uh, it's stretched canvas. It's on a frame. I have a, a couple layers of gesso because I like to have a very thick surface that's fairly smooth, and I'll give it a, a ground. Um, and typically, depending on, on what I want to do, it could be a burnt umber, it could be a burnt sienna. Sometimes I work with a, a middle gray. Sometimes I'll work with um, a red. It, it depends on, on what I want. Something that people need to remember as well is oil paints are very transparent. They're, post, they're not as transparent as watercolors. They can be depending on how you handle them, but they are a very transparent um, type of pigment type of paint and it will, one layer will affect the other layer. So if I start off with a, a burnt sienna um, ground, for example, which is what I started out with, with um, unmarked, that was a, a burnt sienna ground. It's a very warm, very brown sort of color. And I find it sometimes difficult to manage the skin tones because you don't wanna have orange skin unless you're yeah. painting Trump. Yeah. Um, so it's it depends on really the the final effect I want. I've been going towards more of a, a raw umber, which mm -hmm. is more of a, a brownish sort of neutral cold uh, brown. Yeah. Um, sometimes it, there's two ways of doing it. I'll put down my ground, I'll let it dry, and then I'll go back in and I'll do a rough sketch with um, charcoal possibly and you know just to so I know where the height of the figure will be where the eyes will be that sort of thing uh, another way is I'll first create the uh, the drawing with charcoal I'll put the ground down and then I'll, I'll wipe out areas of the painting so the highlights and the midtones and that sort of thing and that's more of um, I, I guess a wiping out sort of process so it depends on really how I'm feeling uh, it's, it's a way for me to create an underpainting or a, um, a grisaille. Mm -hmm. And depending on how far I wanna take it, I can, I can create the entire portrait or the entire painting in a grisaille, a monotone um, with all the details. And then I'll work from there. I can either glaze on top of that with you know multiple transparent colors, or I can start with, uh, you know, go full, um, you know, a full-blown layer of paint and, uh, you know, make it very solid. Typically, my paintings will involve numerous layers of paint. Um, I'll go in and, you know, I'll create the first, what's called the first pass or the first layer. And it's a way to work out the shape and the form of the figure, the way that the light's hitting it, the way that it's causing the form to turn. Uh, and I'm working with very large shapes of the figure and then I I get smaller and smaller and smaller and start to work out the other forms. The idea is not to create detail, but right. is to create um, an illusion of a 3D form on a two dimensional surface. And I just want to say for those of you that will come to visit this exhibition that um, Dee has put um, QR codes on some of the pieces. And if you scan it, you can actually watch his process while he's painting. So it's a really beautiful way to, to see how he builds up his paint, which is really fascinating for like, as an artist and as a non-artist, I just think it's really cool. Um, I, I don't wanna spend too much time on it, um, but 
um, this piece is called Rocket Man. Mm -hmm. So I do have an inkling. Do you listen to music while you paint? I do. Yes, um, exactly. And I have, I have different playlists depending on the mood that I want to instill. I yeah, have yeah. I have this one playlist on Spotify called Depressing Painting Songs. <laughs> and it it puts me into this mood where I feel very subdued and very self-reflective. Yeah. And I find for myself that's how I can get into what they call the zone. Right. Because I, I it's hard to describe, and I know a lot of artists will know what I'm talking about, but you get to this point in the painting process where you're not aware of yourself painting. Yeah but you're just trying to, it's sort of you're connected to the paint and you're just doing something to create whatever it is you're trying to create, but there's no conscious manipulation of your hands. They, it's like they already know what to do. It's, uh, it's so, so true. I completely, I completely agree with you that yeah. you, um, I can't paint without music, right? I need yeah. it. I go the other way though. I go like really loud and heavy and up, upbeat. <laughs> well, it, de it depends on and what I'm after. If I want to have, you know, something like what you see in the gallery, yes. I would use, you know, these, these depressing painting songs. Um, on occasion, I've had these huge canvases that were four by eight feet. Yeah. And you, you work with very large brushes. I use painting brushes from Home Depot. And I'll put something like Guns and Roses on. Yes, yes, um, yes. Welcome to the jungle and that sort of thing, which is yes. really very hyper and very full of energy. Yes. And that will help me create these larger canvases because like I'm a not dance, right? yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm interested in the flow and the energy. Uh, yeah. I'm not in interested in the minute details. So I'd like to move on to the next slide too, if you wouldn't mind. So this one is, this is another self-portrait. I, I love this one so much. This is a self-portrait. I'm not wrong in that, am I? Okay. Um, it is called Rabbit Ears, Oil on Canvas, uh, 30 inches by 30 inches, painted in 2019. Um, so let's talk now about um, the difference between, I've heard you explain the difference between figurative and portrait work, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, okay, I don't consider myself a portrait painter. One of the main reasons is I'm not concerned with the likeness. I'm using the person there, the figure, their face, their expressions as a means of expressing a feeling that I'm trying to express. Uh, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, I had this goal to try to convey the same feelings that a person would feel through my paintings, the same that they would feel if they were listening to music. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to take those feelings that you would feel from music and transform them or transfer them to a painting so you had those same feelings. It's very difficult. I've been able to do it once or twice, but it's it's not easy to do. But I use the figure and the, the person to, to convey those feelings and they don't always look like the person. So in my mind, it's not a portrait because the purpose of the painting isn't a portraiture. In this case, I wanted to have a, a funny theme and I, I posed myself I mean, this, this is me posing for this painting, but this isn't specifically a painting of me as a portrait. As you can see, I've changed it a bit. It's not exactly my features. It's not exactly my eyes, but it was me posing uh, so that I'm, I'm the type of artist, type of painter that needs to paint from life, that needs to have something in front of them in order to create their art. I can't do it out of my head. Um, so, you know, I had to pose for myself and I, I intentionally changed the features so that it wouldn't look so much like me, but uh, the painting itself, Rabbit Ears, it, uh, this is uh, Nana Bojo. He's an Anishinaabe, um, the best way I could describe him is, is a, a demigod, let's say. He's a person with power, he's a, he's a spirit, he's spiritual. Uh, he, he's uh, the creator of the world uh, within the stories of the Anishinaabe, if I have it correct. Um, the old, the traditional, um, Let's call, let's call them the traditional gods of all the people, not just indigenous people, but specifically now we're talking about indigenous people. They're no longer being um, called upon, prayed to. Uh, they've been replaced by Christianity or other faiths. But these, these gods, they're still, they still exist. They're still waiting for the opportunity when people are going to appreciate them again. So I wanted to create sort of a, a funny tongue in cheek 
uh, portrayal of Nana Bojo waiting in the background, waiting for people to stand up and take notice of him again and to need him and to appreciate him. So, you know, he's sitting in his, in his house, wherever that may be, he's watching TV. You know, he has his smudge pot because he's still a traditional person, but he also has his remote control for his TV, right. which is very important. And, and a you know, double rabbit ear system going on. And, yeah, and the subtle rabbit ears in the background, yeah, yeah which is sort of like, I'm, I'm making fun because he also has the ability to turn into a rabbit. Yeah. And I've always imagined him as this, um, this person that goes into a phone booth and he, he pulls on this uh, bunny suit, this, uh, one, <laughs> this onesie bunny suit, you know, and he, he magically turns into a rabbit. Is, um, is sense of humor important to you in your paintings? Yeah, very important. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the issues that I've dealt with in the past, they're, some of them are fairly serious and, you know, you, you can't, I'm not the type of artist that likes to create shock yeah. um, art, um, although I have done it a couple of times. I, I, I find that it's, I'd like to be a little bit more subtle and I like to sort of sneak up on you with these serious issues uh, through the use of humor. Yeah, no, I think oh. that's, I think that's very well done in this exhibition. Yeah, something I wanted to mention as well about figurative and trying to instill that feeling. If you take a look at the painting behind me, it's not complete, but it's something I'm working on. I think this is closer to the effect that I'm trying to get. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people don't know who the model is. I, I think, you know, Tanya, you know who the model is, but most people would look and they don't know who this model is, but they could see the way that he's clinging this stuffed animal. And I mean, I'm hoping that people have this type of a feeling from it. Um, the, the title is The Hug, and it's something that's developed, I think, because of COVID. You know, everybody needs a hug. We, we haven't been hugging. But I wanted to have this feeling of um, letting go or not wanting to let go, of hanging on to something. And I'm hoping that when, you, you know, when people see it in person, they have that feeling about what it's about. And it's, you know, this, this is the use of a, of a person, of a figure, and they're in the act of doing something, but it's not a portrait. So these right. are, this is the type of, this is why I consider my work figurative and not portraiture. Because the, the figure, the, the face isn't important. The portrait of the person isn't what's important. It's the feeling that you receive from yeah. the painting when you look at it. It's a, a representation of emotion. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, I do want to move on to the next one, but just quickly before, um, can you tell me the significance of your Mohawk name, Asanase? Asanase. Um, Asanase was given to me when I was born uh, by my grandmother. And it's actually the name of my great grandfather, who incidentally has a haunted farm, and there's all kinds of stories about him. But um, traditionally within the Mohawk, um, culture names are passed down from person to person and you're not supposed there's only supposed to be one person with that name within a community and within a family so I know that I'm the only person within my community that has my name I, I haven't been able to find it anywhere else you know things have changed you know, they, they now create their own names depending on circumstances but traditionally names are passed down from person to person and my great grandfather he actually died almost exactly 30 days um, before I was born oh, and wow. his name was then given to me uh, by my grandmother and it's it's a name that has a special meaning to me it's because it's a it's you know it's part of my culture I find that it's closer to who I am spiritually than my spiritual part of me which I believe is where my paintings come from like my paintings come from my heart, from my soul. It's an extension of who I am. And I feel that more than anything else, uh, Sanazé represents that part of me. Um, I don't feel that my colonial name is, you know, is representative of me. It's something that's on my license. It's something that's part of my tax returns, but it's not me. It's not my spirit. And I feel that because my Mohawk name is more representative of who I am as a person, um, it's something that should be placed on my paintings. No, I totally agree. And I think reading the, the notes that people have left in your, um, in your book that's in your exhibition here, 
your spirit comes across in every single one of these paintings. It has touched so many people. Um, I have it here with me in case I needed to read some out because they're just, you know, people are, they're loving this exhibition and um, have so much positivity to say about it. I think because of your spirit being here. Um, Monica, would you mind going to the next slide for us, please? Okay, so this is unmarked oil on canvas, 30 inches by 30 inches, painted in 2020. I'm going to read something here from your artist statement, if you don't mind. Um, our elders tell us that our feet have walked upon the back of Turtle Island for time immemorial. Our resiliency has been proven time and time again. We have faced genocide, both physical and cultural, betrayal at the hands of our allies, residential schools, and the murder of our women and girls. Despite this, we are still here. And that's the title of this show. Mm -hmm. so can you tell me about this piece? What prompted you to paint it and what it means to you personally? Um, it's, it's a, first of all, my, my paintings, I don't have a title for them right away. Right. Um, and the, the title Unmarked came to me afterwards and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, this character, she doesn't really exist as a person. She's somebody who came out of my head and I've actually used her for a few other different paintings. Um, in 2020, I decided, I don't know where I came up. It, it just, with me, ideas sort of bloom out of nowhere. Um, they sort of come to the back of my head and they, they, they press and press until they have to come out. And that's when I start painting them because they have that, that strength of force that they need to be born. Uh, for some reason, this painting, like a lot of the other ones, just happened in that way. Um, I already knew uh, the face of the girl because it's always, it's a face that I've been creating, drawing, sketching uh, for five, six years. Um, the circumstance of, you know, where she's standing and how she's standing and what she's doing was something that eventually developed within my, my mind and had to come out. Um, in 2020, I started painting this and there's a process videos for this as well. But my, my auntie actually um, was part of the TRC. She was one of the uh, people who testified during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, you know, there's stories from different family members, you know, they're, when they said there's only 6,000 children died in residential schools, we all knew that there were always going to be more. Um, they weren't really believed during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but we knew. Um, my aunt told me there's more kids out there that never went home. So this sort of stuck with me in the back of my head. And I, I think maybe this is where the painting came from. So in 2020, I started uh, putting the painting together. I did some sketches and I started painting it. And, you know, and then it wasn't until 2021 that all of the unmarked graves started to be discovered. And I realized that this is what I was painting. This is the feelings that I was painting. This is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's almost as though I'm reacting to what was going on. Um, for me, this is representative of the sadness and the loss that Indigenous people have felt and are feeling. And for myself, when I started to read and see the newspapers and the newscasts about these unmarked graves that were being discovered, I didn't realize how much it affected me personally. I was, I went into a, a deep sense of sadness. Yeah. is the best way I could describe it. Um, yeah. And, you know, at that point, I knew what the, the name for this painting should be. I have a, a quote here um, that was taken from the CBC article that you did last year, uh, last August, I believe. Unmarked depicts the loss of culture, language, and of course, children through the historical implementation of the residential school system in Canada. It was created as a reflection of my own feelings of sadness resulting from the loss and has become a time, timely harbinger of what is currently occurring in the increased discovery of children's unmarked graves on the grounds of Can Canadian residential schools. Um, yeah, just absolutely heartbreaking. And it's still, it's still in the headlines. I saw another headline a couple weeks ago that they're still mm -hmm. finding graves, yeah. Yeah, they found more, it's, it's terrible. Um, yeah, I've... I'm guessing they're going to find at least 80,000, maybe 100,000. Isn't that awful? Because they've barely scratched the surface. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, actually, that's a great transition here to laying down tobacco with the next painting, Monica, if you don't mind switching it over. Um, laying down tobacco, oil on canvas, 24 inches by 36 inches painted in 2020. Um, I think we might have touched on this a little bit, but we are still here as an exhibition of portraits, but you've described your artistic practice as not so much portraiture, but hoping to capture the spirit or essence of your models, which you can see here. Mm -hmm. Can you explain your philosophy about the paintings for this exhibition in more detail? And then I definitely want to ask you the meaning behind laying down tobacco so everybody knows why I transitioned with it. Okay. Um... There, originally, these paintings were created out of this discovery that I had. Um, I also go into schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I tell stories, you know, uh, I do a lot. A lot of my work has to do with art and storytelling. And originally about, how long ago was I? Maybe 2008, 2009, I went into this classroom and... I told some stories and they were about grade five, I think. It was out in a portable and I remember leaving the portable at the end because the bell had gone. And one of the little girls that was sitting in the circle listening to me, she ran out to her father and I heard her call out that, you know, over there is an Indian. You know, he's alive, you know. And, and my impression was that she was surprised and she was shocked that Indians existed mm -hmm. uh, because everything that they've learned from this point on were from history books, the same as all of us. We were always people of the past. We didn't exist in today's society. Mm -hmm. So I came up with this idea of a, from a bunch of paintings to depict contemporary indigenous people and which the goal was, we are still here. Mm -hmm. um, whenever you look at paintings of indigenous people, if you do a search on Google, they're always wearing feathers and they're always wearing leather and they're always, you know, you have two, native lovers embracing and you have a wolf behind them and you know this is how people think of us uh, especially in the united states it's really hilarious um you you don't see a lot of portraits of contemporary indigenous people right and i yeah. felt that it was important for me to do this so yeah. i made a call out to you know as many people as i knew who were indigenous and asked them if i could paint their portrait and either they sat for me or they would send me photographs. So all of the paintings that you see are indigenous people from across Turtle Island. I actually have a quote here from your blog, if you don't mind if I just speak of it. Sure. Um, These are modern indigenous pe people taking out of, taken out of the history books and placed squarely at the foot of your local railroad crossing. I like that, uh, yeah. I wanted to put that down. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I wrote that right after the um, Tidenega uh, Railroad uh, they were blocking the railroad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, laying down tobacco, this, this painting specifically, and I, I want to mention too that I don't always like to talk about what I mean for a painting mm -hmm. or my meaning because it's, it's different for everybody. Like everybody brings their own experiences and their own thoughts and, and their own things to a painting, and I don't want to change it for them. I mean, their, their reasons are as valid as mine. It's, it's whoever views it will bring in their own experiences and knowledge. Um, when I was creating this, so I'm segueing into that. When I was creating this, um, there's a, an Anishinaabe um, practice called laying down tobacco. And it's something that I practice myself. Um, you know, it's either for blessing um, or it's a way of giving thanks. Uh, what I will do in the springtime is I like to carry a little bit of tobacco with me because when I'm going around the grounds, the, you know, my, around my home, sometimes I'll find a dead bird or sometimes I'll find a dead animal. And, you know, a lot of the neighbors will pick it up, throw it away in the garbage. What I like to do is to bury, uh, dig a hole, um, place the animal in there, sprinkle a little bit of tobacco. So I'm laying down tobacco and I give thanks to creation for the life of this animal. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a bird that was singing in my backyard, or maybe it's a bird that I was just watching in the, uh, you know, the bird bath. And it gave me pleasure to see this. So I'm giving thanks to creation 
for the life of this little creature. So, you know, for me, that's a ceremony that I like to, to do in the, in the spring. And it, it's, for me, it's, it's called laying down tobacco. Um, so I wanted to create a painting that was sort of solemn in that way, that it, it had this tradition. It spoke to the practice of laying down tobacco. Um, but I also wanted to give it like a, a creepy little feel. Like, I'm not sure, people probably aren't aware of it, but the three figures in the back, they aren't children. They look like children, but if you look at their eyes and their faces, they don't have this childness that you would think. They're um, within the, the, uh, the Mohawk, the Ganyangihaga um, culture, the Haudenosaunee cultures, we have little people and they're sort of spirits, almost like fairies, I guess, in you know, Ireland and Scotland. Um, they're spirits that have these jobs and they, they're kind of mischievous um, they're magical. Um, the one holding the book with the snake, he's in charge of the creatures that are under the ground, snakes and beetles and bugs and those sort of things. The, uh, the bigger guy with the book on his lap that has sort of a, a squash or something on there, I forget what it is actually, um, he's in charge of agriculture, making sure the crops grow. And the guy in the middle, he's a little bit more mischievous. You don't really know what he's up to and he has that look in his face. But if you're ever walking through the forest by yourself and there's rustling in the leaves and maybe a stone or a rock will get thrown across your path or behind you, it's him hiding in the bushes, throwing these rocks. And if you look in his hand, you can see he's holding a, a rock. So I like to, yeah. 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 So I like to place like hints of what's going on yeah. within the painting. Yeah. Does the dog have any meaning? No, I just wanted to throw a dog in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the middle, the middle uh, man is the trickster. Yeah. Yeah, the trickster. Um, well, he's a, it's not really. He's not technically a trickster, according yeah. to the Ishnabe um, culture, but yeah. he's he's mischievous. Let's call him. Right. Um, I've been to a couple of Ojibwe funerals, and when you go, you're given a little packet of mm -hmm. tobacco and then you put it in on the casket before mm -hmm. the person is buried. So I just, I think it's a really um, beautiful sentiment. You know, it's, it's a different, it's a different type of um, way to honor somebody. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, let's move on to slide five. So it's actually just behind me here. Oh, the light might be in the way. This is, it's the big one over my shoulder, right in the center there. So it's kind of fascinating to get a sense of the size of these two, but you will when you come here. Um, this is strength in the community, oil on canvas, 36 inches by 48 inches, painted in 2019. Uh, and you and I have had some discussions about community and I just, I, I love talking to you about it. So what, can you tell me, what does community mean to you? Well, community is very important, um, especially to an indigenous person. Um, you know, community, is where you have your connections. It's where you feel at home. It's people like you who accept you. Um, community is a huge part of our identity of who we are. Um, a lot of, I, I do the occasional talk on indigenous identity versus indigenous ancestry. And the two are very different. Uh, indigenous ancestry means you have a little bit of native blood in you maybe or maybe you went to dna.com and you were you know you discovered that you had some indigenous blood indigenous identity is something that connects you to your community you have a community you have family on that community and you're welcomed as a member of it so you know community is very important um, to indigenous people this painting itself, um, when I created it, it's actually modeled against um, American Gothic by Grant Wood, who painted it in 1946, if I remember correctly. And when he, I don't know if you, people are aware of it or know the one I'm speaking of, it's with the farmer holding the pitchfork and yeah. his wife is standing next to him. This is a very um, patriarchal, patrilineal painting talking about agriculture um, the role of the man, the, the woman is looking off to the man and the man is looking at the viewer, which tells you about the social dynamics at the time where the man was in charge. The man had the power to look at the viewer, but the woman did not have the right. She would have to interact with the world 
through the men. So I wanted to take that idea and I wanted to flip it on its head and to apply it to my own culture, which is a matrilineal culture where the women are in charge. So I've placed the woman in the position of the man. She's in the, the, um, the power position. And instead of holding the pitchfork, she's holding you know, the feather, which is very important. And the man is on the side behind her. He's not beside her or in front of her, he's behind her. And he's within a subservient position to her. And he's only able to interact, to, uh, interact with the world through her the same way that um, American Gothic is. And the background is you know, indicative of what's happening with indigenous people these days, protests and that sort of thing. So I wanted to give it more of a Mohawk flavor. Yeah. And you've given her face such a strength as well. And, and also, I, I'm going to say it, maybe it's a self-portrait again behind her. Maybe you modeled your own face on yeah, it. Yeah, I, I modeled. Oh. Yeah, I, I did. I, it's, it's hard to find models. I can't find people to model for me. And when I have this idea, I want to get it done right away. So I did. Yeah, I modeled for myself again. But I do love the expression on your face. It's definitely uncertain. Yeah. And you're, you're looking at her for guidance. I think it's, it's uh, again, there, to me, there's a hint of humor in it, even though there's nothing humorous about this piece, that hint of confusion in your face and brings yeah. a, a light, a levity to it. Yeah. No, there, there is a huge amount of humor. Yeah. Um, okay. I, also, I found that the be my best paintings occur when the model is more of an actor right. yeah. than, a, than somebody just standing there. So whenever I, I find somebody to help me out, I try to get them to act. I, I, I describe the situation. I tell them to think about something in their past that created the emotion that I'm looking for. And then that's where I work from. So in, I'm going to start looking for people that know how to act. Oh, definitely. That would work. <laughs> and again, going back to community, um, I think you told a story about going somewhere and somebody pointing out to you, hey, do you know so-and-so? And again, it just brings you right back to that community. I think you were in a diner or- Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah. 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 Um, typically when I introduce myself, I'll go, Sego is gonna go aguigu, asanaze ni yungyats, wakskare wage ni ganawage. And basically I'm giving you all the information if you're indigenous to know who I am, my Mohawk name, um, my uh, my clan, I'm bear clan, the community that I'm from, Ganawage. And, you know, this is the formal way for us to introduce ourselves, usually during a conference or a classroom. Um, but when, when you meet another Indigenous person on the street, typically we'll exchange the same type of information. So I was at the Sunset Grill with a friend and we were cashing out. And I have this jacket with a, um, a Mohawk unity flag on it. Mm. And he looked at it and he said, oh, are you Mohawk? I go, yeah. He goes, where are you from? I go, ah, Ganawage. I go, where are you from? He goes, ah, Ganawage. And then he says, uh, do you know um, so-and-so? I forget who he's asking. I said, no, I don't know him. Uh, but do you know um, Ty Alfred? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, <laughs> he, he's the, uh, the god uh, father of my brother's uh, child. And, and so we, we exchanged basically the same information that we yeah, would formally yeah. exchange, but we placed ourselves within the community. We knew who we were, where we were from. We knew who our families were. Yeah. And in this way, we were able to accept each other. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's interesting to me because I, I do live on the Rama Reserve and I've seen this interaction so many times and I find it so fascinating to me to be, you know, I'm from a small family, but to have somebody say, oh, I'm your, I'm your auntie or I'm your cousin. That's my cousin. That's my auntie. It's just, it's that sense of community. I'm, I'm being em embraced as well because I grew up, you know, in, in Moonstone in the middle of nowhere, but I'm, I'm really sensing that sense of community that you're talking about. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing, you know, to have your community like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's also of a, a part of, of trying to figure out who you are and should you be here? When yeah. I was younger, I used to ride around the reserve on my mini bike and you know I would pull over and this old lady would come up to me and she would ask who my grandmother was huh. and I would tell her and then she would know who I was based right. on who my grandmother was so exactly yeah that's that's beautiful I love that <laughs> I, I have a feeling that if she didn't know my grandmother she'd kick me off the reserve yeah, you're, you're out of here. get out of here <laughs> that's funny all right, I guess we could move on to the final slide now. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, um, again, humor. I love this so much. This is called My Great Great Grandmother Was Princess Leia. It is oil on canvas. It's 30 inches by 30 inches, painted in 2019. Um, and again, the, the humor is, I had to end on this one because it's a great piece. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell me the meaning? And I know we've discussed this a bit, but tell me the meaning behind this piece and why is Princess Leia referenced? <laughs> sure. Um, it, it goes back again to indigenous ancestry versus indigenous identity. Mm -hmm. And it seems that for some reason, um, a lot of non-indigenous people and primarily white people, they want to claim that they're indigenous. Um, if they have a small amount of blood, they'll say, well, I'm Métis, because that means mixed. So they'll say they're Métis. Um, they want Indigenous identity. They're not willing to accept Indigenous ancestry. In the United States, it's very popular for people, typically, you know, white women, blonde hair, you know, very Barbie looking, to claim that they're Cherokee or their great grandmother was Cherokee. Uh, so I thought it would be funny to sort of switch that around and and I'm thinking, well, if you can claim that you're, uh, you're a Cherokee because your great grandmother was a Cherokee princess, I can say, well, my great, great, great grandmother was uh, Princess Leia. <laughs> so it's sort of claiming this. Uh, a fictional this, character. This fictional yeah. character, yeah. And you had mentioned, we've talked about this in the past, but there are no indigenous princesses, right? There are no indigenous princesses. Yeah, that was something that developed through the uh, the noble savage uh, idea that was prevalent in uh, Europe at the time. They felt that you know the chiefs were kings, and you know there were princesses and and queens and so on. They were just using a the language of the time to describe uh, what they thought the social structure was. Uh, in a lot of cases, it didn't apply in in many ways, but it's. It's sort of something that has carried on into the present. And there are people in the United States that think that there are Cherokee princesses out there, the word Cherokee princesses. So it's, it's sort of poking fun at these people. Do you think that um, Hollywood has anything to do with that? I'm just thinking back to, you know, yeah. romanticizing. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Hollywood probably had 80%, 90% to do with all of this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're at fault completely. The woman that posed for this, um, did I read correctly that she is in law school? Uh, she's pro yeah, she's probably a lawyer by now. She, wow. uh, when I made that call out, she wanted me to, um, to create a painting for her. And uh, she's from North Dakota. She's now a lawyer. Um, wow. Her name's Emmy Scott, by the way. I'm still in contact with her. And uh, she likes to dress up as Princess Leia. Um, and it, it, the really interesting thing is a lot of indigenous people like really love Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a feeling that it has something to do with, you know, the, the rebel forces fighting against the evil <laughs> empire. I mean, it's sort of reflective of society, I think, or a lot of indigenous people think it is. So, yes. you know. Um, I want to end just quickly before I turn it over to Nanette. Um, something you mentioned in, in your very first um, answer, but I've been sitting on it, is you had talked about when you see people, because your vision isn't great, you look into their eyes. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is so beautifully um, expressed in this exhibition, because so many people have commented on the eyes of the pieces around me, and just the life that you have brought into them. Um, every single person here is a character and every single expression is different and the, the eyes are so beautiful, just beautifully painted, but also very lifelike and expressive. So something not to be missed in person, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dee, did you have anything else that you wanted to say at all before I turn it to Nanette? And then we will also do a Q&A after this. But anything? Anything at all? Uh, no, I, I think I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we touched it all? <laughs> I think we did. Okay, awesome. Um, just before I, I turn it over to Nanette, I, I, I always have a blast talking to you. Thank you so much for doing this. We, I feel like we could go on for hours, but I want to personally thank you. Um, Nanette, you want to... Um, so the first one is from Alex. Uh, he, they just say the QR code is such a cool 
way to marry traditional art with modern viewing methods. Do you want to comment on that, Darren? Yeah, it was an idea that me and Tanya came up with at the beginning of the show. Um, something I like doing is to videotape my, not video, I'm so old, right? There's no such thing as videotape. <laughs> I like to, I like to record um, my process. I, I use them when I teach um, and I like to put them onto Instagram and, you know, put them to music. So I always have these clips, these video clips of me um, creating my paintings or sketching or drawing or, or whatever. And since I had a lot of them, which were associated with the paintings that occurred during the exhibit, I thought it'd be a cool idea to marry the electronic format of these videos with the actual painting. So we have these QR codes set up where you can scan them and it'll, it'll take you to the video so that you could watch them. I think it's the first time we've done it. I think it's really cool. <laughs> I agree, yeah. yeah. Um, and then Valerie Powell had a comment. So I'm just gonna share my screen again really quickly. Um, she comments, uh, interesting that there's a little Hudson's Bay toque in this photo just uh, right here. So good eye, Valerie. Um, Darren, do you wanna comment on that? Uh, I actually, I forget why I put that in there. Um, but I know that a lot of the people are actually people that I know. Um, I know I can't point with my computer, but if you look to the, let me see, left of the female? Nope, the right, okay. Yeah, that, uh, go, go up a little further. Right now, go to the, uh, towards the female. There's a, a little, there's a person with a red toque on. Uh, she's actually mm -hmm. a friend of mine, Pam Agua. And the other two are other singers that I've seen. Uh, so I try to throw little portraits of different people that I know into my paintings in the background and they're, you know, they're there forever. So they don't have to thank me. They can thank me later. <laughs> That's awesome. Eight. Oops. Um. Then Alex also asks, uh, what other works do you have planned? Um, well, the painting in the background is probably representative of, of the direction that I'm trying to go. Uh, I want to create more multi-figure paintings and I want to try to express those feelings that I'm trying to, um, you know, I want to give the paintings more feeling, I, I think is what I'm trying to say. Um, I want to have more complex multi-figure paintings. I may try to attack some of the indigenous stories that I know, but you know, for me, I just want to have, um, try to express more feeling in it. Yeah, it's, it's a process, well, we're all... <laughs> never know. <laughs> <laughs> we're all looking forward to seeing what comes next. Thank That's you. for sure. Uh, Dave Osborne says, uh, talking about telling stories, thank you very much for the stories that go with your art. Very enjoyable and meaningful. Thank you. Uh, I believe that's all I can see in the question and comment section. There's one Q&A here. Oh, there is? Oh, there yeah. is. oh, it just popped up. Oh, there from, we go. From a Miss um, Lindsay Earl. <laughs> uh, Yes, Lindsay says, I'm blown away that you're self-taught. What advice do you have for people that are looking to improve in their own art? Just keep on practicing. Um, you know, it just, it takes, they, they say it takes 10,000 hours to master a, um, master something. Now with me, I find that the, the first thing you need to do is you need to know your material. You need to know how your palette will work, how you mix, when you mix colors, what it will create how the paint will go on. You need to have a very good understanding of how your materials will react and how to work with them so that it becomes second nature. And then once you have that established, then you can go on and try to create paintings with meaning. Up until that point, I suggest that you just paint anything, draw anything. Drawing is very important. You need to know how to draw as well. Um, painting is an extension of drawing. So, you know, learn to draw very well, then learn to use your materials, whatever they are. And then once you have that, that skill, then you can move on to more complex issues. I compare um, the ability to paint 
the same way that a musician learns to play a guitar or other musical instrument. Like they're not on stage looking at their fingers and trying to figure out the chords. For them, it's natural. They know where those chords are. They don't even have to think about it. They, they just, it just happens. Their, their fingers are attached to their mind. They know what to do. So for me, painting is like that. I don't really think about, you know, where do I put this, this, you know, this dab of paint or how do I mix this color? I just know what I want to create and my hands automatically know how to create it. I've been working with oils for 45 years. So, I mean, it's, it's come so naturally to me that I don't think about it. I'm, I'm more concerned about creating that form and creating that, 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 um, that illusion of three dimensionality. Mm -hmm. So practice, 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 practice. <laughs> Um, and then also from Lindsay, uh, who's clearly seen the exhibit, Tanya, maybe you could take us to this, uh, this painting, um, but she asks, yeah. uh, well, she says, I know you didn't touch on it tonight, but I'm desperate to know the story behind Don't Trust the Chickens, the Chickens Lie. Can you talk about it, please? <laughs> sure, I'd love to. Um, when my son was about five or six years old, he's, he's, he turns 20, actually, in, in April, um, when he was about five or six years old, he had this, this fever dream. He had a cold or a flu and he had a fever and he was screaming and he woke up and I went to him and he saw, I, I think he was probably still sleeping, but he looked at me and he says, don't trust the chickens, the chickens lie. <laughs> so ever since he was little, whenever something was a little freaky, you know, you know, you, you walk down the street and something's not quite right. We look at each other and we go, don't trust the chickens, the chickens lie. <laughs> so it's sort of a catchphrase for us. And I wanted to, to show that in a painting because it was just, you know, it, it was all about him at this point. Yeah, I love the expression on his face too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, lots of comments coming in now, but I did have another question uh, from Corinna. How do you navigate an artist's block not knowing what to do? specifically next? Um, I'm actually at that point right now. Um, I'm tip I can typically paint 60 paintings in about um, less than a year. Uh, right now I've probably created about six. So I'm sort of at that point where I'm at, I have a, a, an artist block, but the way that I work through it is I just, I continue to create anything. It doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, I'll work with small canvases and I'll set up something, a still life maybe, or I'll, I'll just find a, a, a picture that I want to, and I just create. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It has, doesn't have to be beautiful. I can just throw it away if I want to. It's just something that I want to keep on going. And I find that through this exercise of continually to create or to paint, um, I'm able to get those more creative juices flowing that allow me to create that masterpiece that I'm looking at. Like not everything's going to be a masterpiece. You just have to keep on producing, keep on creating, keep on exercising that artistic muscle. Um, just, you know, paint an orange, paint a cup of water. As long as you're doing something, you'll get through that block. The worst thing to do is to sit there and say, well, what am I going to paint, you know? And, you know, because it's not going to work that way. You got to do something. All right. Is that it? Are we good? Yeah. Yeah, that was great, Dee. Thank you so much. Like I said, always a pleasure to talk with you. And I think I need a recording of you for those days where I can't paint. Just keep painting. Just keep, Just keep painting. painting. Yeah. Keep painting. Not everything you do is a masterpiece. Just keep going. I think we yeah. all need that in life, actually, not just about painting, right? <laughs> yeah. You yeah. gotta, you gotta keep trying. You know, it does. I, I have a lot of paintings that are stinkers, and uh, <laughs> you know, I usually just paint over them again. Yeah. Actually, I, I had an exhibit a couple of years ago, and some of them were on the wall. And I ran out of canvases um, during COVID because I couldn't get any supplies. So I started painting over paintings that were exhibited. <laughs> and, I, and I told the old curator what I had done. She was like, I can't believe you painted over that painting. It was beautiful. 
And I go, I didn't like it very much, so I painted over it. All right. Well, I think it, we can wrap this up then, everybody, right? We're good to go. Um, I, again, I just, on behalf of everybody, Dee, I want to thank you for this. Um, and, you know, please come in to see this exhibition. It's truly beautiful, and it's very beautiful in person. So worth worth the trip to really, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see everybody. Bye, everybody. Have a nice evening. <laughs>